everyone, I am Mohammed Hassan Mujahad and as you can tell from my topic, I am from Pakistan and the topic I am going to cover is Advancing Peace and Community Leadership in Pakistan. Before I go on, I would firstly like to uh, thank Professor uh, Daryl for giving me an opportunity to come over here and express my views and share about my country because I am a great patriot of my country and I am always willing to share it with people internationally to let them know about what Pakistan is because due to the, unfortunately due to the media, many of us have the wrong impression of Pakistan as it being a very uh, a terrorist country in the world but it's actually not that, we are great promoters of peace. <clears throat> I before I go on to any of my slides, I would like to give a small introduction. I am, as I know, as you know that I am Muhammad Hassan Bajat and I am an engineer by profession. So it's very inter interesting to have this diverse topic about peace coming from an engineering point of view. And I have my bachelor's done in chemical engineering, where I did from NUST, Pakistan, and my MSc was in petroleum engineering from Delft University of Technology. That's why I have experience in both Pakistan as well as in the European region. So I can compare the two countries together and what I learned from there. Currently I serve as a lecturer at DEWIT, which is the Daud University of Engineering and Technology in the Faculty of Chemical Engineering. And I have, I have always been a volunteer of social work. I have done many social activities. I work as in a community for community purposes, I worked in SIUT, which is the Sindh Institute of Urology and Transportation, Transplantation, where I worked with the patients. I worked in the Aga Khan Hospital, which is a well-known hospital. And I also worked helping the earthquake victims of the deadliest earthquake which has hit Pakistan ever, which happened in 2008. But my most recent contribution was that I volunteered in an organization which is called B. And that has worked to promote peace and diversity amongst various ethnic groups in Karachi. The point here is that why I'm focusing on Karachi. You will get to know the answer of this as I carry on. But just to give you a brief intro about it, that as my topic is promoting peace and community leadership in Pakistan, Pakistan is a vast country and it is not possible to cover all aspects of it. So, and as I come from Karachi and it's the biggest city in Pakistan, I decided to narrow down my topic and focus it on one aspect of Pakistan for a better understanding. So, hence, I will focus on Karachi. Going a step further, I would like to talk a bit about Pakistan. That's the national flag of Pakistan. And as you can see, that is the map of Pakistan, which is divided into four major provinces. The four provinces are Sindh, Punjab, Balochistan, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Interesting facts about Pakistan is that we are a large country. Our population is over 200 million, which is a huge number. And as I said, we are bordered by these four provinces. And the Fun thing is, or the interesting thing is, that all these four provinces have their very own culture, dress, food, language, code. So all of us are diverse. You won't find two provinces having the same culture. So that is quite interesting. And the other thing is that we are great followers of peace. We are focusing on peace. but. Considering our geographical location and history, at the moment the relationships are not very peaceful. So in the north, uh, we have a, in the north we have a dispute with Afghanistan. Then on the other border with India and um, towards the west with Iran. So we are in that strategic position where things are not uh, things are looking very bleak. Therefore, the youngsters today we are focusing on peace and that is why I am here at this conference to promote that peace so that we get along and I can explain that indeed we are not as bad a country as we have been defamed through the media. And if you look at the second map on the right, I come from Sindh region which is right here and the southwestern part of Sindh you will find Karachi, right where the green dot and the orange line join at that little pinch coming out and this is the region which is in the extreme south of Pakistan 
and it's surrounded by the sea, which gives another reason why we are such a diverse region. <clears throat> Before I go on, I would like to show you the diversity of Karachi. The first picture is like uh, the mausoleum of the creator of Pakistan, Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. The second one is what was made by the British. The British ruled Pakistan for a long time and the structures are built on their own structures. Then we can see that there's a tower down which is called the Meriwether Tower and the fifth picture is our sea. We have our own sea which and all these group of people are diverse. We can see that the their color, their culture, their creed, their clothes, they all are different. So Karachi is one city where a lot of diversity will exist, unlike the other provinces of Pakistan. In other provinces, for example, if I talk about Punjab, you will only you will majority find Punjabis over there. But if we talk about Karachi, you will find a lot of different sects, you will find Many different communities, including the Zoroastrians, who are the fire worshippers. We have a few Jews. We have a lot of Christians. We have the non-believers or the atheists. We have the Muslims. So it's a big diverse country, a uh, diverse city. And obviously, we can expect the diversity since it is such a large city. And I will give some interesting facts about Karachi. Our population is over 20 million people. And 20 million is a large number for a particular city. This city alone is larger than many of the European countries. As I mentioned before, I've been to Europe and many countries in Europe have population which are just about 5 million. And that is one fourth of the population of my country, of my city, which is a big achievement. <coughs> Going on, the question arises that, sorry, I think, yeah. Before I go on to this question, I need to ask another question that why do we have such a large population or why uh, we face such a situation in Karachi? Then example, the answer is simple. As I mentioned before that Karachi is a seaport. Being a seaport, it's, <clears throat> it's a point of settlement for many trading families because that is where they do their business. And these families, they came from pre-independence. The people who were originally from Karachi who were born there. Then there were families who came after independence. They migrated from India when Pakistan and India got partitioned. And the third type of people over here are those families who come from the other provinces of Pakistan because they see a great opportunity in Karachi. They can start their own businesses of spice and other communities and goods. So that is how all these families, they come, they merge together and the populations of Karachi increase. Not only do the populations increase, the ethnicities and the diversities increase also. They bring their different cultures and their different beliefs and as a result, there are limited resources. All these families, they compete for the same limited resources and as you can see or as you very well know, if I take a simple example of an ecological system, we always know that if there's an example of animals living together in a specific area called niche, and there are different groups, the animal which will survive would be the one who is the most fittest or who is the, who is the best at getting its resources. So similar situation arise arri in pa uh, Karachi, it became survival of the fittest. And due to the survival of fittest, may uh, ethnic diversity grew and extremism and ethnic violence erupted and this is what diversified the people further and what we have to uh, focus on to try to remove this diversity and this violence amongst the people. So as I mentioned before that there is security and violence particularly in the most diverse area of Karachi. And due to these violences, people are deprived of the basic, simple needs. The most two simplest needs of people living in a particular place are simple education and health facilities. But due to this violence, we are deprived of these uh, two basic needs and it is difficult for people to leave their homes who are the natives as well as the people who are coming into these places. So, 
like I said before, it's like the survival of the fittest and the weak are just locked in their houses. They cannot come out. If they come out, the different diverse groups or the ethnicities, they scare them off or dominate them, which results in a great bloodshed. So now the main question arises, what to do in such a situation? The question which arises is, how do we make, how do we focus on these communities and bring them together? We should remove their differences and help them provide inclusion and acceptance of each other. Because definitely, if there's great diversity and one community does not accept another group, a region will not prosper. There will completely be chaos, commotion, lack of leadership, a lot of violence, and all these things will not affect the uh, country in a positive way at the end. So we had to take a specific approach. Our goal was, our goal was to remove these problems or to understand this problem. But the main problem that we faced was that these diverse groups, they were not willing to talk to each other. They were refusing to just communicate and it gives sort of an impression that every community thought that we are better compared to the other community or we are superior. So how do we tackle such a, such a situation? Because if it gets out of hand, then it can be very problematic. So the approach that we took or the B organization, we divided our research or our steps into six basic criteria. The first was to understand the core values and culture of each different group. This was followed by developing relationships. The third step was highlighting the common challenges which took place, followed by follow-up meetings, capacity building training, and the results that we understood and the results that we obtained from our experiment. So first of all, I would like to focus on understanding the core values and the culture of each different group. We spoke to young people. And here I'm going to emphasize on the fact young. The reason why we are talking about young is because the old people, they will not have the same sort of feeling as the youngsters do. We are the future generations and these young people are the ones who are going to be the future leader. They are the ones who are going to, who are focusing on peace and not like the elderly. I can give you a classic example of this, that even when I was young, our elderly and similarly, I could say that across the border, the other elderly, we were always taught that a common example that I should give, it's at a peace conference, so I mean I should just relay the facts which are true, was let's say about the disputed territories of Kashmir. Now the disputed Kash territory of Kashmir is between two different nations, Pakistan and India. Both the nations claim that this territory belongs to us and our elderly people, they always focus on, for example, my elderly people said, no, the Indians were wrong. This, this community belongs to us. Mm -hmm. And as I had friends who I studied with Netherlands, they said that they had been taught that this community belongs to us and the Pakistanis are wrong. So, it, in a way, it was kind of brainwashing the youngsters. So, the elderly, they just follow what, the, what they have been taught. So the change has to come amongst the young, youngsters. These are the people who are going to make the difference. They are the future leaders. So our focus was primarily on the youngsters to do this experiment on the youngsters to try to tell them and to bring about the peace. So how did we approach this situation? We wanted to find out that why these youngsters, they are having conflict amongst themselves. Why is there such a diversity amongst them? Why are they constantly fighting? And the standard stereotype answer that we obtained was that the youngsters said that the latter who we are competing against, they are from that community. Now, what do we mean by that community? I mean, they've been brainwashed, they've been told that XYZ is not from your community, so he is, he is different from you. And, and the youngsters are being threatened from that. And this is what is removing the peace in us in our city. The funny part is they have never interacted with these people. They have no interaction. All they've heard are like old wives' tales that uh, this uh, person belongs from the other community. For example, 
just the same way as our ancestors have talked about the disputed community, both are the same comparisons. We haven't actually experienced the people around, talked to them. So how can we comprehend that who's the enemy and who's the friend? So that this is why we focused on the youngster and our main focus was on developing relationships, which takes me to the second point. This is the major step that is taken into this six-stage proposal that we wanted to build relationships. So again, we concentrated on youngsters and we took a random sample of 20 youngsters. And the random sample was done in a systematic way. For example, there was a certain age group that was selected from 20 to 30. We focused on these people and to make it unbiased, we focused on different ethnicities. We did not focus just on one group because then there would be bias sampling. We focused on different groups to come out with their own views. And we gathered these young people from the community to work with because we wanted them to initiate the change. It is these youngsters who are going to do the change, not the old elderly, not the people who are going. For example, if I have already crossed part of my life, the, I'm still young, it's not, I'm not saying I'm not young, but then there are other youngsters who have to come and the people who are yet to come in the world, they are the ones who are going to bring the change. So we hosted a peace cafe, we called these youngsters together from different ethnicities, we talked to them, we tried to explain to them what's going on, how to accept the others and why is there such a diversity building amongst them. And we wanted to get their viewpoint, what they thought what they expect, ex expected and what they accepted. Now we highlighted the common challenges. The meeting that we had, we used this meeting to highlight the common challenges that was faced by each group and the main idea or the main objection that each group had was that we are being deprived of the basic requirements. The basic requirements are again health, education, transport facilities, clean water and food. So during this meeting, the concerns of the young people were highlighted and addressed <coughs> and a focus was done in order to bring them and to collaborate with each other from different ethnicities in order to promote peace, which was our prime objective. So how do we follow up these meetings that we've done? We decided to do follow up meetings, which is point number four, and we did it by a bi-weekly basis. Two basic points were focused on these meetings. Firstly, possible ideas for calibration and secondly, identify the resources that were required for the calibration. Interestingly, we decided to, use, uh, we decided to calibrate these youngsters in a smart manner. The reason I say smart, we know there are different backgrounds and there's different enmities and hatred amongst us. But the one thing which unites the people of Asia and especially Pakistan is cricket. We all are crazy about cricket and we revere that sport. So what we decided was we are going to hold a cricket competition and this was no ordinary game. It was decided that the teams were going to be formed. Whoever was interested in playing the game would be in different groups. For example, if I say that someone is a Punjabi from another province of uh, Pakistan and someone is a Sindhi, they would be put into different uh, teams. For example, what I need to say is that there are two Punjabis, they won't be put together in one team, they will be put in different teams so to remove the diversities and to get the interaction and the intermingling of different communities. So that was the approach that we had decided. Then we came on to the fifth step which is the capacity building training. A capacity building training was done for our 20 participants we taught them, we, decide, we showed them how to collect funds, how to run the event, do the event management and come up with the solutions. The training covered the concepts of planning, fundraising as well as creating awareness amongst the participants. At the end, once the training was done, a simple match was played which was organized by us in which we got the groups together. The final step after this building were our results of what we actually found out. The result was that different communities became more open and more friendly with each other. They came together, they accepted, they accepted that another community or different ethnic groups actually existed. It was not about my anymore, it was more about we. 
or in other words, it was more about us. From our experience, we were able to ascertain that the most important aspect of advancing peace and community leadership is building relationships. The relationships are built on the outcome of trust once the common goals have been achieved. Relationship building works wonders in achieving your goals, but it takes time. The time taken in building a good relationship is trying to understand the cultures, the people around. And if you, if you do not understand these relationships, then you are at point zero. If we did not have the first interaction with the community, the first interaction we did, we would never have been able to come up to this point or building relationships. It would have been difficult to pick any specific points needed to address as commonly in order to have an effect. Lastly, another important thing that is required for building peace and community leadership are resources. But resources are meaningless again if you do not have simple relationships. You may have many resources, but without relationships, these things cannot exist. Hence, it supplements to the point that relations, relationships are the most important things in promoting peace as well as community leadership in any community. And lastly, I would like to show some of our results. Sorry. These different images we take. If you look at the first image, you see all of them are wearing different caps and different robes. These belong to the different provinces of Pakistan. As you can see that the person who's wearing a thing around his neck, that is a different attire than the one who's wearing who's on the extreme left, uh, who's on the extreme left. Different provinces, different cultures, but they all are look very happy. They belong, they feel the identity that we belong in one group. We are a team. The second picture, everyone is sitting together, different groups, different color, culture, caste, but they're all meditating and looking peaceful in the workshop. As well as in the sports, they all are playing together under the one banner, the banner of peace. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you. That's what we're focusing on. Thank you. <coughs> my first question is, so you start at zero and above that you become more peaceful, is that right? Yeah, uh, actually why, when I say we start at zero, we, uh, I meant that the communities, they are refusing to accept someone who is different from them. They are threatened by them. So that's what I call, call zero and as the time goes on, because this was not a one day project or two day project, it was a three monthly project till as much as I did and it's still continuing on mm. onwards because it's an organization the communities they are starting to accept other communities mm. so the groups different groups are coming together as a group so that is what I mean that from zero they are going up and still a lot of work has to be done we aren't where we want them to be at the moment but we are making strides so it's a positive initiative step and I'm sure that if it's worked on you would certainly get somewhere with it. So I'm just thinking, for example, if I was actively hurting people or even killing people, should you call me zero or should you call me negative one or two or three? So could you, have you thought about that? If your scale should actually be zero or it could be zero as neutral and then plus or minus. What, what do you think? Well, I would not give any <laughs> negative scale or zero scale to that because I mean if you're killing someone that is like totally out of uh, the ethics of the situation because these sort of things, it's, it's not more of a killing point of view, it's more of not accepting the other person or just competing with the resources and thinking that uh, it's just like survival of the fittest, you're just com competing with resources to get the gains. It's not like uh, hurting someone in that mm -hmm. manner. So it's it's just like uh, whoever gets the, whoever is the stronger party, that is all. We have, do not have like killings and shedding, so I cannot like compare on that whether it's negative or something. But if you generally ask me, anyone who's condemning or killing should definitely be under negative and should be properly 
groomed because i don't i don't consider that as humanity to take any sort of life for personal gains i ethically that is not correct and i would not consider them as a human i would just consider them as an inhuman person for no reason can i ask a question yeah actually it is because of afghanistan which is close to you exactly and because afghanistan was dominated by usa and russia that is the or ussr as you want to call exactly. that's the reason why your community is not mixing with one another and there is no unity it is because of them that pakistan became divided yeah and the divided and see even though mahatma gandhi separated pakistan separately yeah. all muslims should live in pakistan and a little bit of punjabis little bit of mm -hmm. sindhis are all support to be with pakistan in spite of that it is because of usa and because of ussr that uh, pakistan had become what you call uh, no uh, what you call unity no peace i would like to add further to that and another then, another let yeah, me finish okay. yeah? another thing when you were mentioning about kashmir let me tell you sheikh abdullah he became a dominant in uh, kashmir before that it was a hindu dominant. king who was ruling pa kashmir that is the reason why we were keeping quiet and when nehru was there as the prime minister he was also keeping quiet whether to divide kashmir into two with sheikh abdullah and people with sheikh abdullah to be consolidated with the pakistan and the hindus to be consolidated as far as india and the group of india states of india is concerned but sheikh abdullah was imprisoned in kodaikanal where i was uh, <laughs> ruling as the vice chancellor he was put in a kohini kohinoor uh, building he was put in prison and one punjabi the punjabi governor uh, his uh, father was also <laughs> put in prison in kodaikanal after that he died there and uh, he was built uh, something there you know what do you call uh, and yeah where uh, they died there and samadhi we call it so things like that had happened you see it's because of such difference between hindus and muslims when people try to create a lot of uh, say uh, what do you call uh, differences the, the diversity diversity enmity. and the enemy actually there is no enmity between uh, muslims and hindus at all it is because of afghanistan that is the first reason and the second reason is that people are uh, where they are um, supplying uh, uh, what do you call na uh, uh, paso long hai eh? arms and munitions arms and munitions it's because of uh, arms and munitions which were distributed and which were uh, asked by people to make use of that that there was what you call there was no peace there was no community unity that's the reason but now people are now saying that there should be and so they want the that that's what the education is uh, doing because it's mostly as i mentioned that we are promoting peace amongst the youngsters i don't know about your side of the uh, part but our youngsters we don't go by those stories that we've heard because most of our youngsters we go to study in the states or the european regions and we interact with indians and uh, other students and we just see that there's a lot of similarity and what uh, what the other side of the border they are facing the same situation what we have faced they are all just stories so we all want to bring the change yeah. and it is it is yeah. we we as youngsters who are going to bring the change because that is the only way the world will go yeah, forward even, even in india maybe in hyderabad maybe in kerala there are muslims yeah. but we don't find that they are yeah. different and we are different Exactly. it is only because the prime minister or the chief minister they are the ones who are creating the such differences. problems between muslims uh, and uh, hindus there are and our brothers yeah actually yeah. we don't find they are different mm. let them worship they are worshiping yeah. allah we are worshiping god it's the same we British don't think that it is different at all they emphasize so now we are laughing at uh, the chief minister and the prime minister <laughs> same thing happens why they are because... doing such things <laughs> they shouldn't do such things there should be unity there should be peace that is exactly what we are saying on yeah. our side of the border that there should be peace and <coughs> yeah there, there should be peace between uh, both the communities yeah there is no difference okay.
happen. And I think that is what the initially the founders wanted. I think Gandhi was going in that direction also as well as Jinnah because both of them wanted the yeah, unity. Yeah, Jinnah is also a very nice person. Both wanted and unity. And we all uh, and have it, read about him. It just became the yeah. undisputed community and now it's working like that. Other questions or comments? It's good Nepal stays out of it. <laughs> other, we know about Kashmir. Are there other areas of dispute between Pakistan and India? India. Hyderabad. Yeah. Hyderabad. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, Hyderabad was another area. Yeah, of in Hyderabad, I was in Kerala. Yeah. The Muslim community is there in a particular area. But there shouldn't be difference between Muslims and Hindus. Mm -hmm. there, there are no differences. Actually, we don't have any difference. The Muslims also, they don't have yeah, any difference just against us. But it is only the ministers, the chief minister, the prime minister, they are the ones who want to create such a big problem. We tolerate. We tolerate. The politicians couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> they want to put size. We don't believe in such things at all. Ne neither do we. Yeah, I know that. Yes. I know that. See, we, we believe in so many film stars in uh, Pakistan. <laughs> Beautiful film stars as well as what you call good doctors yeah. and they are very good doctors when compared to the Indian doctors so you should uh, really give them some uh, importance but such importance is not being given it is because of the no, party no, men no, but <laughs> hopefully maybe in the next 15-20 years things would change because of yes, the sir. education yeah. and many peace movements which are taking place I'm sure that there many such movements would be taking place around your uh, country also where organizations are focusing on this yeah, right. so i mean uh, maybe that's let's hope for the positive and in the next 15 20 years yes maybe as long as nehru was the prime minister he yeah. never wanted such things to happen but uh, sardar Vallabhai patel yeah. he wanted such things to happen. Well, I mean, there are so many who want such things to happen. happen yeah thank you thank you okay excellent thank you so we need to see how it works in a sense oh, yeah. oh, okay. and how the indicators of peace and I think I'd look again at your scale I think there you have a cope, scope even though you don't like negative uh, it gives you more flexibility so a person who kills people is not zero it's below zero yeah that's what I would say so yeah so, so you need to give a number you know what you know and uh, so I think that's a rethink Good, thank you very much. Thank you.